Hey, econ students, this is Jacob Clifford. I'm making this video to help you practice some of the key concepts and calculations of macroeconomics unit two. Inside the ultimate review packet, I have several free responses for each unit with answer keys and videos like this one that explain the answers and give you some tips and strategies to make sure you're getting it. And don't forget there's other ultimate review packets by other amazing YouTubers for US history, world history, human geography, calculus AB and BC, and AP English language and AP chemistry and AP environmental science. And of course, AP government, which a lot of students take with AP math. Macroeconomics. For now, go to the Macroeconomics Ultimate Review Packet and click on Free Preview if you haven't already got it. Scroll down to see Practice Free Responses and download the free responses that go here with Unit 2. Sit down, try them completely on your own, then take a look at this video where I go over the answers and explain it all. All right, let's do it. Here we go. Macroeconomics Unit 2 is actually one of the easier units and it feels a lot like a social science. There's a lot of vocabulary, a lot of general concepts, and it's pretty easy except for the calculations. In fear response number one, we're going to talk about calculating unemployment. Make sure you understand the key concepts. In fear response number two, we're going to focus on GDP, GDP deflator, and how to calculate that. The one thing that's not covered here is CPI, but I have a video explaining consumer price index and how you do those calculations. And if you've seen that video, you know that calculating CPI is all about the base. Okay, let's jump into fear response number one. The following table shows the number of people for each category for country A. We have people who are full-time, employed, part-time. We have frictional, structural, and cyclical unemployment and of working age, but not labor force. Your teacher or professor is gonna give you these sort of questions with a bunch of numbers to make sure you can calculate unemployment rate, labor force participation rate, and understand what you're doing. First one, calculate the unemployment rate for country A. First, we have to find the number of people who are unemployed. We can calculate that by looking at uh, these three categories, 15, five, and 20,000 for a grand total of 40,000 people are considered unemployed. And then the next question is, what do we divide that by, right? So um, you're tempted to be, am I using the 200, the 150? Well, it's the labor force. We know that we're not gonna use the 200 because those people aren't in the labor force. Labor force is made up of people who are employed and people who are unemployed. So it's these 40,000 plus the additional 160,000 people who are full-time and part-time employed. So that would be 160 plus 40 is a grand total of 200,000 people in the labor force. Again, what I'm doing is I'm adding up all the people who are employed and all the people who are unemployed, ignoring all these people who are working age but not in the labor force because they're not in the labor force. So that's it, but I gotta multiply this times 100. Whenever your teacher says show your work, you gotta set up the equation. The equation for unemployment rate, number of people who are unemployed divided by the number of people in the labor force times 100, this would pop out 40 of 200 is 20% unemployment. So let's make that worth one point. Again, the answer was 20%. Um, and again, you had to show your work to already get the point. Next one, is the natural rate of unemployment for country A greater than, less than, or equal to your answer in A, and to 20%? So it's got to be either equal, greater, or less than. The answer, it is less than. Okay, remember, the natural rate of unemployment is just frictional and structural, and that's it. So this includes cyclical unemployment because there's 20,000 people cyclical unemployment, so we must have a recession or a recessionary gap. We, the economy's not doing well because we have cyclical unemployment. So the natural rate of unemployment must be less than 20% because that 20% is including the cyclical. Now notice, the question says explain. Oh man, teachers, professors, they are into making sure you fully explain. So if you wrote less than, you would get no points. You gotta explain it. The natural rate of unemployment includes only frictional and structural, not cyclical. Forgive my shorthand, you have the answers, right, in the ultimate review packet, so I'm just writing this really quick. Don't do this on your actual free response. The natural rate of unemployment only looks at frictional and structural, it doesn't include cyclical, so the natural rate would be less than the number we came up with before, which did include cyclical unemployment. Okay, and C, calculate the labor force participation rate in country A, show your work. For this one, the labor force participation rate is the number of people in the labor force divided by the number of people who are working aged who could be in the labor force. We already know the labor force is 200, right? We already calculated that earlier. And if we look at these additional 200 people who are not in the labor force, plus the 200 people who are, that tells you the total number of people who are of working age times 100. This would say there is 50% 
right? 50% is the labor force participation rate. Now that one is gonna be another point, one point there, and we'll say this other one, B, was worth a point, so three points. Again, you had to show your work and explain to get the full point, make sure you're doing that. All right, now in D, assume that many people that were not in the labor force permanently moved to another country. Would the labor force participation rate in country A increase, decrease, or stay the same and explain. All right, so some of these people, this 200,000 people, end up leaving the country and they're gone. The question is, what's gonna happen to the labor force participation rate? It is going to increase. So the, it's gonna increase and make sure you explain why. Now I'm running out of room here, but you have the answer key. You see what I wrote out fully, but make sure you write this out to get the explain point. Just understand the idea if the number of people who are of working age and not labor force falls, then the percent of people who are in the labor force is gonna get higher. The percent of them, the total is still the same, but the percent's now higher because this number actually fell. What I'm writing here is something like a larger percent of the working age is in the labor force. Again, that would explain it. Another point right here, make sure to explain when your teacher tells you to explain. All right, and E, assume instead, so ignore all the other stuff, that 10,000 cyclic unemployed workers were able to get part-time jobs, calculate the new unemployment rate, and show your work. The first thing to remember is it doesn't matter if people have a part-time job or a full-time job, they're considered fully employed. So the part-time, full-time doesn't matter, just consider that people who are employed. So these 10,000 people of the 20, so this falls down to 10,000, Right? I'm just gonna write that up there. And then this now goes up to 20,000. So all we're really doing is redoing what we did in A, we're calculating the unemployment rate. So now it would be 15 plus five plus 10 for a grand total of 30,000 people who are unemployed and the number of people in the labor force hasn't changed. So this is still 200,000 people inside the labor force. All right, times 100 gives you 15% unemployment. That would be a right answer, 15%. Okay, that would be another one point for a grand total on this free response. One, two, three, four, and five. Five points on the whole thing. How did you do? And if you did really bad, just remember it's okay as long as you're learning from your mistakes. There's also some practice sheets inside the Ultimate Review Packet where I have you practice this more. So just make sure to sit down and try it again. Okay, let's move on to fear response number two. Again, this one's gonna focus more on GDP, nominal, real, the deflator, and understanding those general concepts. It's got a little inflation in there as well. Free response and number two, the table shows the quantities and prices of only three goods that can be produced in country X. Assume 2020 is the base year. Again, it's all about the base. Okay, first up, calculate the nominal gross domestic product for 2020, show your work. To figure out the nominal GDP, that's just the total value of all the things produced in 2020. And we can do that by adding up 25 times $1. So the apples brought in $25, the shoes five times eight is another $40, 15 times four is another 60. For a grand total, of $125 is the GDP, the nominal GDP. But by the way, since 2020 is the base year, this is also the real GDP. So the real and the nominal are the same number if you're looking at the base year. Now we're gonna calculate the real GDP in 2021 and show your work. So how did you do that? Well, prices are different than 2020, right? They've gone up, but we don't wanna use those 2021 prices. We wanna go use the 2020 base year prices. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply the quantity of 2021 times the base year price. So there are 30 apples that times $1, that's 30 GDP real, adjusted for inflation, seven times eight, 56 dollars of shoes, 16 times four, what's that? Alexa, what's 16 times four? That's 64 for the hats. So you add that all up together and you end up with $150 of real GDP for 2021. Again, what I did was I took the quantities from 2021 and multiplied them times the base year prices. And so what we're doing is we're adjusting for price, right? That's what real GDP does. It takes out the inflation. Since we're here, we might as well add up some points. It was one point, including the showing your work for A, another point here. So far, two points. 
How you doing? Okay, and C, it says calculate the GDP deflator for 2021 and show your work. The equation is the deflator equals the nominal GDP divided by the real GDP times 100. That is the deflator. The deflator is not a percentage. It's kind of like CPI. It just tells you, it's an index that tells you how prices change relative to a base year. Now you're going to be tempted to say, okay, the uh, nominal GDP is 125. The real is 150, but that doesn't work because this right here was a nominal GDP of 2000. 20. We're not looking for 2020, we're looking for 2021. So we have to go calculate the nominal GDP of 2021, not 2020. So to do that, we're going to take the quantity of 2021 times the price of 2021. So 30 times 15, that's 150. 7 times 10, that's 70. Uh, 16 times 5. Alexa, what's 16 times 5? So that's 80. This is 150 plus 70 plus 80. That's $300 nominal GDP. Again, the way I got that is multiplying the quantity of 2021 times the price of 2021. And that just tells you, not adjusted for inflation, what the total GDP is for 2021. Now we can go throw that in the equation I already wrote down. The deflator equals the nominal, which is 300, divided by the real, which is 150, times 100, and the answer is 200. This is not a percent, right? 200 is the GDP deflator for 2021 based on uh, showing you prices have increased by 100%, which makes sense, right? Adjusting for inflation, prices have gone up 100%. Okay, now in D, assume that 2018 wages increased 20% and inflation was 50%. All right, the inflation was 50% and the wage increase, right, the raise someone got was 20%. Did real wages in this year increase, decrease, or stay the same? Real wages adjusted for inflation definitely fell decrease. Now again, it asks for why. Well, why? If inflation is causing prices to increase at a faster rate than your wage, then your real wage is going to fall. You're getting paid back and getting paid in dollars that have less purchasing power adjusting for inflation. So if this person's wage increased by 50% and inflation was 50%, then their real wage would be staying exactly the same. They get paid more in raw dollars, yes, but the purchasing power of those dollars would be the same if inflation rate and the wage rate increase were the same. But in this case, inflation is eroding that value of those dollars purchasing power is falling. Again, you had to make sure to explain. I'm not gonna write it out here. You have my answers, you can go look at them, but just understand you have to say something about purchasing power. And the last one, E, assume that Chris gets a fixed rate loan from a lender when expected inflation is 30% and the actual inflation turns out to be 50%. All right, we have unexpected inflation, it's higher. Who benefits from the expected inflation? Chris, the bank, neither or both, and explain. Well, in this case, it's gonna be Chris. Now, here's a trick that might help you when it comes to inflation, borrowers benefit and lenders lose. So when the inflation rate is 30%, but it ends up being 50%, then Chris is paying back this loan with dollars that have less purchasing power. And again, you have to explain that concept out to get the point here. Make sure to fully explain this idea that Chris benefits because he's paying back dollars with even less purchasing power because inflation has eroded the value of the money. Again, I'm not going to write that out there, but you should. And if you did it right, you get a point. You also get a point here. Let's add them all up. One, two, three, four, and five. Another five points here for this one. Hopefully you did well. But again, remember that macroeconomics unit two is relatively easy. There's a lot of definitions and just simple concepts. The only things that are tricky, we've practiced calculating unemployment, making sure you understand GDP, GDP deflator, and of course, there's the CPI stuff. We have to do those calculations as well. And if you need more help, make sure to take a look at my ultimate review pack. It has plenty of practice and four full practice exams to verify you're actually getting it. So make sure to do both three responses and multiple choice questions. Please also subscribe and leave a comment. Let me know if these videos are helping you. Thanks for watching, till next time.